Hello and welcome to another installment of our Women in STEM series. My name is Kaylee Peel. I'm the manager of Strategic Partnerships for the Library. And today our guest is Angela Kansani from Bioscience Core Skills Institute. Angela, welcome. Thank you. So to get started, would you mind sharing some of your background? What led you into STEM industry and what was that trajectory to get you to BCSI? So I circumnavigated the globe to get here. Um, there are many people who take that more traditional pathway through school and then they finish their degree and then they arrive at their career and then they climb the ladder of their career. Um, statistically, however, what we're finding is fewer than 17% of people actually complete the traditional or normal. So I'm not sure why they call that normal. We all kind of have to navigate all of the pathways and follow our interests and our passions until we arrive at our destination. I think BCSI for me is my destination. So I grew up in a really small town um, in Missouri and luckily had an extraordinary high school biology teacher. So I thought I was going to become a famous researcher. That's what I wanted to do with my life. Um, so my first year of college, I went to IIT in Chicago, which is sort of like MIT, but in Illinois. So it's a engineering and science and math school. But we were very poor. We didn't have enough money really to to maintain that situation. It wasn't sustainable. Tuition was extraordinarily expensive. My parents were taking out loans and doing things. So my dean, luckily in college, recognized that I was in a, a difficult situation with the tuition. And I had done some high school research projects. And he utilized my high school research topics to continue my research my freshman year. And then he basically sold me <laughs> to another school. So the University of Iceland stepped up. So I went to Reykjavik, Iceland as a sophomore and moved and lived there for four and a half years and ended up getting my, my degree in biology there. But of course you don't get to choose who you fall in love with. So I came back to the States and I fell in love with an army captain. And if anything is a career record, the Army will wreck your career. Um, moving every 18 to 36 months for the next 10 years of my life. So I had to sort of reinvent myself everywhere that we went. So we would get stationed someplace new. And at that place, there would, you know, I have to kind of investigate what was going on in the area and figure out what I could do. So in my life, I've been a professional orchid grower in Puerto Rico. Um, I was a caterer and catered for the Command and General Staff College Foundation. Um, and I, I played a lot of video games, you know, so just to keep busy, just um, kind of utilizing my time. Um, when we left Puerto Rico, I was pregnant with our first child. And so then there's that gap in your life, right? That, that where that kind of takes over everything, a baby and a toddler and raising my son. So I had to find some sort of career that would work with that. And I knew he was going to be starting school. So I got a degree in elementary education. So I did that all online because we were moving too much. I graduated with that and hated it. Like found out I could not stand other people's children. <laughs> like they're, they move too much. They're too loud. Um, it was too chaotic. I, I really hated teaching social studies. So then I was stuck again. Luckily, the school that I went to, Western Governors University, which is a really extraordinary online program, they were starting a master's program. And I had stood out to someone at the school. And they reached out to me and asked if I would be interested in kind of being a member of the legacy class, the first class through their master's program, and f in exchange for feeding back my criticism and my feedback to them so they could improve the program, they would give me a, a scholarship. So I took the full scholarship and got a master's in secondary science education. I decided I was going to teach high school students. Um, so again, reinventing myself over and over, as you do, right? All of us do this. Um, that resulted in me having this master's degree, teaching, it started to teach um, as soon as I got out. I was one semester as a high school teacher, and the local community college reached out and asked if I would be interested in teaching community college classes. And I finally found my place. That was my home. I loved these students um, coming from all parts of the city, you know, with, and nobody goes to community college kind of on purpose. Very few students set out 
on their journey with the idea, I want to go to community college. Instead, it's generally some sort of remediation for mistakes they've made along the way or changes in career or, you know, it's all about kind of, I've got a big new dream. So every student you interact with is, is had, comes in with an inspiring story, something, you know, their plan and you get to be a part of that and that's the most compelling thing about teaching at community colleges is that you get to be a part of their narrative and they come back and tell you, you know, so it's really engaging and exciting work. So I started that in Colorado Springs um, when, when my son was in school and we moved back to Kansas um, when he was in third or fourth grade. I finally was going to get my PhD. That was the big plan finally get my PhD because I'm surrounded by PhDs. I t I'm a college professor. It's time to get my PhD. So I started my PhD work at KU and my son got beat up at school. Um, and it was awful because it was so traumatic for him. He wouldn't go back to school. At one point we were driving down the driveway and he bailed out of the car, which was terrifying to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized this just wasn't going to work. And so I had to quit my PhD program again. What am I going to do? Well, I knew I loved teaching community college, so I contacted Casey KCC and said, I would like to come teach for you. And they were very interested, and I started teaching at KCK. Got my master's instead of my PhD. So I now have two master's and two bachelor's degrees, all of which were products of no grant plan, but instead just the realization that I have to, I have to reinvent myself for my situation at that time. Um, and I homeschooled my son while I did all of that. And so he didn't go back until he was a sophomore in high school. So you, that's how we navigate through this. So after teaching at the community college now for nearly a decade, um, a colleague of mine at Johnson County Community College reached out with this big idea of BCSI. And along that same line of being part of narratives and changing lives, it immediately resonated with me that this, this is a way that could, we could disrupt education, we can disrupt workforce, we can really make change in students' lives. So that's the short story. That's an incredible story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And it speaks to so many things that I think are important for women to hear in STEM, within STEM, the larger umbrella, right? There's a level of flexibility and resiliency because um, all people, but particularly women, we are mothers and we are you know, um, in charge of families. And there are a lot of different ways in which we can get on and off the ladder when it comes to our careers. So the fact that yours was not nonlinear, it was very nonlinear, that would be very inspiring. It's inspiring to me, but I'm sure it's inspiring to a lot of different people because you are representing a, a large swath of women in our community. So thank you for sharing that. And there's a level of, you know, access and opportunity and equity that the library is also, you know, really focused on because you're right, whether it be community college students or, you know, more marginalized groups of people, there really needs to be um, a level of advocacy and mentorship that it sounds like you did have throughout your life that we need to instill in, in young people across the board. Um, so I'd love it if you spoke a little bit more about that. Tell me, you know, um, so the library has, you know, career exploration, some STEM education initiatives that we're working on, um, but how is BCSI empowering young people? Tell me about the credentialing model. Um, tell me about how you're impacting not just our region's young people, but, you know, young people across the country. So the, in order to understand that, people kind of have to understand the philosophy under, that underpines micro-credentials. Micro-credentials are, it, it sounds like a tiny thing, right? Mm -hmm. Micro, which means incredibly small. But what it does is it takes your traditional credentialing system and it disaggregates it into the pieces and parts. So the way I always explain it when I'm meeting with industry partners is, what does the bachelor's degree bring to the table for you? What do they come to the table with when you say, bachelor's degree. Now let's take those components and list them out. Now what if I credentialed someone for every single one of those components? Would that, be the, would that bring the same thing to the table? Does an individual have to have a bachelor's degree to do the job that you're advertising for? Because the reality is, and I taught for KCK for years, so, and I, so I'm, I remain vigilant about the fact that many students do not have the ability to quit work and go to school for four years to get a job. And we don't understand that. Scholarships will not feed them. 
scholarships will not house them. They just pay the tuition. So they, they need the, the wraparound services that go along with that. Or we need to solve the bachelor's degree problem. So can we talk about these jobs and do they need a bachelor's degree? What micro-credentials do is that they credential for each of those granular pieces, each of the discrete pieces that come to the table when someone says bachelor's degree or someone says PhD or someone says master's degree. So there's a greater national conversation going on around this too that a lot of people are not um, not engaged with right now. There are organizations out of MIT and Harvard are working together on this. Um, Jobs for the Future is working on this. The Department of Commerce and the Department of Labor. The idea being, what if you owned a digital wallet that listed, had in it, credentials that listed everything you had learned in your life, the aggregate of who you are when you enter workforce? And what if you could utilize that wallet as currency to interact with workforce and secure for yourself the job that you are qualified for but currently unable to articulate that to other people. So the way that kind of um, increases the whole equity and access idea is this means community college students can ac accumulate the learning, but not just community college students, high school students. There are many of these jobs that can be performed by students fresh out of high school if they've gotten the training that they need before they enter workforce. So it's, it's a flattening effect that says, I am not a race. I am not an age. I am not uh, a wheelchair. I am none of these things. Instead, here's a digital wallet of what I can do. And what you can do is the single most important thing to the companies. And so it eliminates all of the biases that they encounter and reduces their learning and their knowledge and their skills to a digital packet that they can share with the world. So cutting out all of those things that currently create ceilings mm -hmm. for various groups. So that's the real power of it. What's amazing to me is that they want to disrupt the entire system with this, right? The entire workforce system. And there's a great value proposition for industry, particularly in biotechnology, because as a, a, a C, C class or C office type officer within the organization, you can scan the nation with this data. So if you imagine these are digital wallets, and you register them in a central repository, and you own a company, and you're like, where should I locate my next factory? Where should I locate my next research facility? When you search this data, the texture's all there to say, oh, look, there's a small suburb outside of Kansas City, high skills, high unemployment, perfect place for me to put it. Right? So it impacts economics. It impacts the U.S. bioeconomy. So it's a much bigger and more explosive picture than even the individual work that we do with students. I'm more interested in the students, but there's a value proposition there for every single company in the country to buy into this idea. Yeah, it's, it, it'll make huge impact, and we need to be looking at these things more holistically. So I'm glad that you were able to kind of explain how it touches so many different things. I think micro-credentialing, that kind of topic, seems a little, um, it's, I don't know, it's a larger idea that a lot of us don't know about. And it, I think, you know, we've been hearing it for the last couple of years, but to see how it's really going to affect everything in our society, economy, all of those things, it's really exciting. Um, it's something to look forward to. So what has been your experience then introducing BCSI and the concept of micro-credentialing to companies, what are kind of the obstacles that you're facing, um, if you don't oh, mind sharing a little? Yeah. yeah. So the funny thing is, is I'm an educator, so I speak in education vocabulary. It's something that I encounter all the time. Um, so I use the word assessment, and industry doesn't know what I'm talking about. And so we've had to adapt our vocabulary and adapt um, the way we explain value propositions to multiple groups because we're not just selling this to students. We're peddling it with educators. We're peddling it with industry. And then we're peddling it with those uh, grant funders and the states. And so there are a lot of different audiences for this. And that leads to uh, many obstacles for me. Um, students immediately get it. They're used to getting a certificate at the end of their program, some sort of um, thing that says, you know how to do this thing. So they get it. Educators get it because they're used to handing those things out. And all we do is just explain to them that they're smaller. Um, industry, if we change the vocabulary, they 
the comprehension kind of dawns on them slowly. Mm -hmm. And when they do get it, it's almost like that, um, that emoticon that you see on Facebook with their heads exploding. They're <laughs> like, wait, what? So when they do finally um, conceive of the idea and wrap their heads around it, it's, it's a big deal. But it's a long walk because we're educators and we're not great at communicating within their circles. Every circle has its own esoteric vocabulary. So that's been a learning curve for me um, this last couple of years, learning to discuss this with our industry partners, industry advisory boards, uh, professional groups. So th that's probably the biggest impediment I have. The second biggest one is they just don't have the time to engage. They don't. Um, as educators, we work a certain number of hours, but then we also have our breaks along the way. And during those breaks, we go to conferences. That's when we do all of these things. So it's embedded in our job to have engagement time with the community. Um, within the biotech industry, there's, there's very little of that. And that being the case, fi them finding the time to come to the table and meet with us, meet with our partners, meet with education assets and training assets in their region that's been a little tough for us. Yeah, that makes sense. And so hopefully, I know, as we're working more of a, as a collaborative ecosystem here in Kansas City, I'm hoping we can kind of alleviate that. That's what we're trying to do at the library with the various initiatives that we have with the Business Leadership Council. We want to be able to kind of be the connector for organizations like BCSI and those companies because we all are wanting the same thing. We all want to inspire and create more access for young people, particularly those we might not have you know, created access for before. Um, but we all have to be, I think, a little bit more mindful and more strategic on how we achieve that. So um, I, think, I think we're almost there. We're getting there, uh, especially in Kansas City, you know, we're we're now, you know, very much a tech city, a STEM-centric city. So how can we really take it to the next level? I think it's exciting. Um, so aside from outside of micro credentialing and BCSI, um, what are some ways that you would like to see our region better support and uplift marginalized groups, young women? What what are you wanting um, our community to do more of? So. They're doing it. Mm -hmm. That's the great news. It is great. Kansas City is really innovating. Um, the Kauffman Foundation is supporting several different initiatives that are extraordinarily exciting. Um, the Co they're sort of rebooting the KC Scholars idea around these digital wallets and creating the infrastructure to support it regionally. Within it, so in Indiana right now, in Indianapolis, they have this Ascend Indiana, which is a, a, a infrastructure, a digital infrastructure that allows their industries and their hiring entities to interact with their workforce talent assets it, through a digital interface. And now um, the Kauffman is supporting that being done also here in the Kansas City region. And I think that's going to be a game changer. Mm -hmm. Because again, if the people doing the hiring can look at the people available for hire, I mean, so think about it this way. When I was a kid, if I wanted a job, I would just look in the paper, mm -hmm. and the paper would, had all the jobs, literally all the jobs, and then you would do the circles, and then you would send out your stuff. The, the downside to technology and to the internet is that we have distributed the jobs across multiple locations. So if I were looking for a job in the biotech industry right now in Kansas City, I would have to go to the Thermo Fisher page and navigate to their careers page. And then I'd have to go to Indeed and I'd have to go to Monster and I'd have to go to LinkedIn. And then I would just have to hope that the job that I wanted, I would find searching all of these um, various venues. What they want to do is make a central careers page and then inform on that with what credentials the individual holds, whether it be traditional credentials such as a bachelor's degree or a community college degree or their diploma or less traditional, they completed a boot camp and acquired the following skills, BCSI credentials, all of that will feed in as data points and the individual interacting at the, as talent looking to be hired will have that sort of digital wallet that they will be able to display. My favorite thing about the digital wallets too is you can click on just the things that are important for that job. So they don't have to wade through my history as a professional orchid grower mm -hmm. to find out I'm an educator. Instead, I can just tell them these are the things that I can do that are important to you. 
So examine these things closely. And then if you want to know more, reach out to me and I can share my entire work history. So that's super exciting. Um, the other one is Governor Laura Kelly last year passed um, new legislation creating an apprentice office at the state level in Kansas City. And I'm so excited yeah. about this because apprenticeships are key to skills acquisition. Um, I nearly became an elementary school teacher because I got a degree in elementary education, and as a student who loves to go to school, I loved getting that degree. Nobody ever let me try it out. I needed to try that out way earlier. I could have saved myself a lot of money and a lot of time finding out that the very act of doing this job was unpleasant to me. I meet students all the time with big plans to become different things, and as I interact with them, I become concerned about whether it's a good fit for them. They have no way of finding that out. Apprenticeships solve that, which is one of the biggest problems we encounter in education. You've spent all this money and all this time, and then you find out you don't even like doing the job. Mm -hmm. And then you're stuck because you blew your financial aid and there's no circling back. And those are tragedies to me because that's a lifetime mm -hmm. of unpleasantness ahead for that person to find out that they really dislike their job. They don't have the choices that I had to just reboot and start over. They've, they've blown it and then finding their way back is tough. So I love the idea of apprenticeships. I love the idea of deploying those across an entire state. I really love that this allows individuals to maybe skip that long education process and go straight into a job that they love because the apprenticeship gave them the skills they needed to get the job and engage them with that company, which gets them familiarity, which increases their chances of getting the job. I love everything about that. The last thing that's super exciting to me that's going to filter down into Kansas, um, Kansas has a large prison population. And I've worked with them for years. I teach non-majors biology at the federal penitentiary at Fort Leavenworth. Initially, I was frightened of doing this, and then I found out it's not written on somebody of what they've done, mm -hmm. and that many crimes are committed as a result of, I just saw a movie the other day that says we all have the ability to be a felon. We just need one bad decision on one bad day. And um, I found that to be true for many of my um, we call justice influence or justice impacted individuals in my life that I deal with. The federal government has just finally um, eliminated the ban on individuals who are incarcerated being able to utilize Pell Grant. Mm. This is a game changer. Mm. So this will allow individuals who are currently incarcerated or formerly incarcerated to apply for and get Pell funding to go back to college. And I think this is going to be a big deal here in Kansas. You know, I live in Baser, so I've got Lansing Correctional right there. I've got the Federal Penitentiary at Fort Leavenworth, both the disciplinary barracks and the Joint Regional Correction Facility. And some of we've got some great minds that are currently locked mm -hmm. up. And being able to tap into those minds, change their lives, they can have careers. They can become not only super productive, but you know, innovative within some of these spaces. So all three of those are um, things that are happening here in Kansas that have me very excited. That is very exciting, and that is very much disrupting a system, that, the only system that we know. So I, I, I love everything you just said, and thank you for sharing all that with me. So that, that leads me to my last question. You've kind of hit on it, you know, innovation and kind of breaking a lot of different ceilings, but what does the future of STEM education and workforce look like for you? Like, what, is that, what do you want it to look like, both, you know, regionally, but also nationally, internationally for young people? So I always answer this, I get this question a lot. People say, well, you, you know, if you could change the world, king, we call it a king for a day question. Mm -hmm. If you can be king for a day, and, or queen, queen for a day. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. If I could be queen for a day, and I could make some decisions within the biotechnology workforce space in particular, because that is my focus, and it's going to need to be. Mm -hmm. um, biotechnology is about to explode because of cell and gene therapy and because of biomaterials. I want a national mm -hmm. training center and I want it here in Kansas City. We're the middle of the map. Um, currently, the only really great training centers that I've seen, and I've traveled all over the country with BCSI looking at training organizations, but this equipment's expensive. 
And because of that, there's only been two states where I've seen where the individuals had the resources to do actual biotechnology and biomanufacturing training at the level that it needs to be done to prepare, prepare individuals for this level of workforce. And one's in North Carolina, and one I just got back from in Boston. Um, these are beautiful places with full-size industrial bioreactors, um, and they are doing everything right with their training. And because of that, individuals who leave those training organizations are able to get jobs right away in all kinds of different companies, Pfizer, Thermo Fisher, Millipore Sigma, the big, big companies with upward mobility and tuition reimbursement so they can go back to school. I want that for Kansas City. I want a national training center, and I want it right here in Kansas City. I want a BTEC, a biotechnology training center, with full industrial facilities, full industrial equipment, and funding on the long term enough to adjust as technology adjusts in the workforce. If I had a future that I could plan for Kansas City, it would be a national training center in biotechnology right here in Kansas City. I think you're on the road to that, and I am excited to follow you on that path. <laughs> Angela, thank you so much for being here. It was a true pleasure. Thank you for having me. This was a pleasure. Absolutely.